Isn't that you great? Can we just like... I just, I'm just so proud. I'm proud of them as their youth pastor, just watching them use their gifts and their talents uh, to serve the body. And I just want to say thank you to this church family, to Paul and to the elders. This really is uh, just an incredible thing as a family that you are supporting them and allowing them to be up here this morning. So thank you all very much for the time that we get to be here in leading worship. Thank you to Georgia. Georgia is the word, like she stepped up and said, hey, I want to lead a worship band. I said, awesome, because I'm not the one to do that. She's done a great job. And her husband, Christian. Uh, and so, yeah, as Paul said, this is a youth Sunday. We're excited to be here this morning. We're hoping that every fifth Sunday of the month, it's happened four times a year about, that we as a youth get to be up here and get to just be a part of the service. And that's something that I'm very thankful for. Also want to recognize in this Memorial Day weekend, those that have given their lives to serve. So thank you very much to our, our even our service members that have been in the military that sacrificed their lives and those that, um, that are in there now. So thank you all this morning. And uh, as we get started... I just want to. I just want to know. As you hear the word teenager, what comes to mind? Yeah, there's some chuckles, right? It's like, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's hear some of the things that were on my list: hyper, loud, hormonal, expensive, maybe annoying or selfish, bottomless pits, drama, and for them, some of the more educated Gen Z or Generation Z is what this generation is. But for me, over the past few weeks, even months, I've been thinking about this word or maybe this phrase is that this generation and teenagers are the leaders of tomorrow. So you, they will be our engineers, they will be our teachers, our doctors, our nurses, they will be our pastors and our elders, they'll be our political leaders, and they will be, every, I mean, everything that we can think of, that's, that's who our teenagers will be tomorrow. And the way that they are influenced today, the way that their beliefs and their character are influenced today will be who they are tomorrow. And then they will take that with them into their jobs, into their families and relationships. They will take that with them into the polls and maybe into some of the decisions that they make. And so as we look at this next generation, they are leaders of tomorrow. And for me, I'm like, how do we invest? How do we influence them here in this church, in this family? Because if we don't influence them, or we don't influence them in a positive way, then they'll be influenced by the culture. And so, really, I'm asking us as a church family, how do we influence this next generation? How do we invest in this next generation, those that uh, will be the leaders of tomorrow? And so, I just want to share with you a few things that are maybe unique characteristics of this generation, what they're going through. And so, let on, if you could put this up. It says, Gen Z... Is the always on, so we could actually, yeah, leave it there. I'll let you know and go next. Gen Z is the always on generation. They're the most connected generation that the world's ever seen with access via the internet to whoever, whenever, wherever, at any time. If you name it, they can get access to it. But because of this reality, they're also exposed to more advertisements and influences than we ever were before. In the 1970s, there was every, the average person was exposed to about 500 ads per day, which seems like a lot. But in 2007, that jumped to 5,000 advertisements per day the average person experienced. Can we take a guess on what it is today? Someone said like a million. I was like, not quite that much. But it's between six to 10,000 advertisements a day that this generation is getting blasted at them. And then you add on that the news from every town and city and nation and culture. And then you add social media and the political and social influences. And they're, they're soaking all this up at the same time their bodies are changing and their hormones and their emotions are raging. They're trying to filter through, man, what, what do I need to care about? What, what do I need to believe? Who do I need to trust? How do I trust this? And all of this, this influences and, and images and things that are coming at them, they're trying to navigate I know there's maybe some things that are easier for these, this teenage generation than maybe I had to go through or maybe you had to go through. But I wouldn't want to be going through this all while I was changing and developing and trying to figure out who I was. It is a difficult time to be a teenager these days, and I think the stats prove that. So, Ladon, if you want to go to the first one, so here's some statistics about this generation known as Generation Z from 1997 to, to now. So there's more than a third 
One in three high school students have experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness in 2019. That's a 40% increase since 2009. Suicide-related behaviors are also a growing problem for adolescents. In 2019, approximately one in six youth reported making a suicide plan in the past year. That's a 44% increase since 2009. Suicide is now the second leading cause of death in this generation. And even before the COVID lockdown, Gen Z has been determined, determined the lonely generation. According to the SocioPro, it says that of those Gen Zs polled, 65% sometimes or always feel lonely. 19% have no close friends. Or 19, let me go back. They have no close friends. And 87% say it's difficult to make new friends because they are shy. It might be the most connected generation that we've seen, but some of them have lost the ability to have face-to-face interactions and connections. They were born with smartphones and social media, but they weren't given the tools how to navigate them in a healthy way. So these are the things that they're going through and experiencing as a generation as a whole. Now, that's not to say that everything about this generation is bad. Here's some, some positive things that we see in this generation. It says they're less likely to drink, smoke, take drugs than previous generations. They are also more entrepreneurial and pragmatic than the generation before them. They value relationships, those that that have solid ones. And they love people no matter how different they are or shocking their lifestyle might be. They're interested in being self-starters and in finding creative ways to educate themselves and better their lives. They strongly dislike hypocrisy and they're unwilling to go along with institutions merely because of their perceived authority. So that's just a little bit about this generation and some of the things that they're going through. And needless to say, it's different than when I grew up. And the reason why I tell you that is because I've been involved in youth ministry in one way, shape, or form for over 25 years of my life. And you're like, wait, let me do the math. Yes, my dad was in youth ministry, and then I was a part of it, and then I volunteered. And now being a youth pastor for almost five years, I can see that the way things are done, the way things were done then, are not necessarily the way things we want to do it now. And the things that worked then don't necessarily work now. And it can be easy to say, well, this is just this is the way we've always done it. And kids laugh and they have a good time. And so we'll just continue to do it this way because they love it and they have fun. But for me, as a, as a youth pastor of this church, and I know for this church as a whole, we don't want to just do youth ministry so kids have a good time. Our hope is that in youth ministry, we see them take their faith with them into their young adult and adult lives. And so we as a youth staff, really set out to figure out what is it that makes this generation tick? What is it that influences them? What is it that really impacts their faith so much so that it takes them with them into the next step of their life? So we did, over the past few months, we read this book. We came across this book called Sticky Faith. And it really answered the questions to me. What makes their faith stick throughout their young adult and adult lives? And if we want to invest in the next generation and see, man, what are some positive things that we see? We read this book. And what this book was about was they interviewed six or a thousand students over six years in this college transition project to see these different factors and things that impacted that. And some of the things that we found were really interesting. We might not agree with everything the book said, but two of the big rocks that we found really seemed to be like eye-opening to us. We wanted to share them with you today because we know you care about our youth as a church family. And so, let me share with you uh, what is the first thing that we recognize, and it's this. The first thing that stood out to us is that intergenerational relationships in the church contributed to having a stronger faith. So here's what the book uh, led on, if you want to go right here. It says, our sticky finding results, the closest our research has come to that definitive silver bullet is this sticky finding. High school and college students who experience more intergenerational worship tend to have a higher faith maturity. Coming to youth group once a week for an hour is like, is good and they have fun, makes an impact, but a greater impact is when they're around all of you as a church family. When they're experiencing these relationships and getting to know one another and worshiping for them to come up here. And so I just thought, man, this is very easy. We're going to quit youth and we're going to get them all in church on a Sunday morning, right? Easy. Yeah, you know, you know, my kid wants to do nothing to do with this church or the adults in it. And that kind of, there, there's some truth there because that's another finding that this book has. One student said this, 
in regards to the relationships with the adults. It says, I think they see us as kind of scary and that we're the people on the news, you know, who are dealing drugs and um, getting pregnant and all those sorts of things. Keeping us separate and treating us like we're a hazard. High school seniors really don't feel supported and loved by their uh, church adults and adults in the congregation. And I want to recognize that's only one student. That's not every student. But I think there is some truth to that. When teenagers come around adults, they're like, oh, man, they're, they're kind of really big and older and they're hairy. I mean, the pastor's got a beard. And <laughs> Sorry, Paul, I had to. Uh, but they are. They're, they're different than me. And usually the interactions that I have with adults is it's like, what did I do? Okay, what do I need to learn? And they just chalk it up and they recognize that maybe, maybe this is just for the big, the big adults and then youth, our youth buildings back here, is for the youth and the teenagers. And that's, where, that's just where everyone's happy and comfortable. So then how do we break through some of these barriers that seem to keep our youth outside of church? If, if church is a place where I mean, being a part of it and being in it we see their faith stick. How do we break through some of these barriers of uh, them kind of not wanting to come? And here's the sticky finding that they said. It says, more than any program or any event, what made kids more likely to feel like a significant part of their local church was when adults made an effort to get to know them. It's our love that makes their faith stick. It's getting to know them, finding out their name. These students, that's what it is. They want to know that they are loved and cared for. Not just by me, all right, the weird youth pastor that just loves to hang out with kids, but by you, the church family. And, I mean, for me, I was like, that's the greatest thing. That's one of the greatest things. Like, yes, how do we as a church family become more loving and more welcoming to these students? And that it is. And, and when that happens, other amazing things happen. Sci- the scientific research supports it. And the stuff that I've looked into is that when students, when teenagers are a part of a community, when they feel supported by their parents and the community around them, they have better mental health, which we see as an issue amongst the generation. They do better in school. They're less likely to engage in risky behaviors. And they're more open to hearing from Um, those that love and care about them. And so for us as a church family, what that means is, make sure I get it right here, is that when they experience love from the church family, they're more willing to hear about the truth of Christ from us. And I tell this to my staff, my youth staff, all the time. I say, students don't care what you know until they know that you care. And really, that's that's the first finding, is how that we as a church family How do we love and care for our students? Because when we love and care for our teenagers, that is what makes their faith stick. So that's the first finding I wanted to share with you. The second finding is this, is that students gain more from observation and experience. A easier way to say that is things are caught, not taught. All right? They are watching us. And parents, I need to talk to you, parents of teenagers. You are the greatest influence in your kid's life. They're watching you. The book, the research that in the sticky face says, yep, even though they, it seems like they don't want to spend time with you and they just want to hang out with their friends or on the computers, they're actually watching you. And they're saying, okay, what are my parents' faith like? And how does that look? And what does it mean to be a Christian? And uh, in a poll, in the 2019 poll from Pew Research, it showed this statistic, and I want to show it to you. Uh, Ladon, if you could put it up. It's really the relationship that parents have with their teenagers and their faith. And it says, among parents who say that they attend religious service monthly or more, 88% of their students are attending church monthly or more. Now, it's probably because they don't have a car and their parents make them. But the other side of that, which to me stood out, is that parents who say they go to church a few times or less a year, 89% of the students go to church less than one time a year. And so... Really, it's kids aren't going to bring themselves to church or they don't see it as important if their parents don't see it as important. Among parents who say that they pray daily or weekly or even monthly, a few times a month, the likelihood of their child or their teenager praying is good. But those that pray very few times, seldom or never, 82% seldom pray. 
And so that's really a big statistic. This, it's, they're watching what faith is and what Christianity is based off of their parents. And lastly, among parents who say that their religion is important in their life, very important or somewhat important, you have it 45 and 41 percent. So that's over 80 percent. And then if it's not that important, well, then guess what? 80% of students think that church is not that important. You parents have a great influence on your kids' lives. And instead of saying, I think church is important, I think you should go to church, they're going to say, oh, mom and dad go to church. I think I'm going to go to church. We might kick and fight, but they're more likely to do that if we live it out. Well, that doesn't put our church family off the hook either, because I know that there's some of our students here in this room that maybe their parents aren't Christians or believers, and they still come, and they're like, okay, what does it look like to be a part of church? What does it look like to be part of a family? And so this applies to us. How do we model, how do we live out our faith amongst these, these youth, these teenagers? How do they catch it? Right? We don't want them to just be taught at it. I don't want to just, I can talk a lot. And uh, my wife knows that, and my kids know that, and even some of the youth know that. But what is it that we're doing that they see this is what it looks like to be a Christian? And it's so impactful. Because, I mean, when I was a teenager, and I don't know about you, but every sermon my youth pastor preached, I could tell you word for word what it said. How many of you guys? Okay, I lied. How many of us, right, uh, who were in church or in youth ministry remember the pastor's sermons or the, the youth pastor's sermons? Not many of us. But we do remember the things that they did, the ways that they lived out their faith. My youth pastor, I could maybe remember one of his sermons or one or two things that were important to him. But I remember more than that was the time when I sat on his couch pouring out my life and my struggles and my problems and he was just there next to me listening, encouraging me, supporting me, praying for me any way that he could. I remember at a men's prayer breakfast, we got together and, and there was a lot of these older guys that were scary and stuff. And so I'd watch them like, okay, what do they do? What does a men's prayer breakfast look like? We eat breakfast and we pray. And that's the, mostly what I saw. But what stood out to me was that at the end of this men's prayer breakfast, all of the men, including those that at the time, like six year and older, and they had like wobbly knees and canes and if you're 60, I'm not saying that you're supposed to be that old. It's just when I was a teenager, they all looked like they were 60 and older and they had canes. But they're more like 80 or 90 year old men. They would get out of their chairs and they would get on their knees and then they would pray over the chair. Not because they meant, not because they thought that it was like anything special or was going to do anything different. But they recognized that God is somebody holy and that we are to revere him as our father and as our Lord. And that stood out to me. Like, I remember those things. Like, yeah, God is a God to be worshipped and to recognize our place before him. I remember Joyce Tate. Joyce is an amazing lady at, our, at the church that I grew up in. Biggest smiles, just worshipping, hands up. And the church that I grew up in, man, it was like one person might be bold enough. She was, didn't care. She'd come up to you with the biggest smile. She goes, how are you, honey? I go, so good. I'm so lucky with the life that I have. She said, you ain't lucky, honey. You blessed. Blessed. And I always remember Joyce Tate saying that because that's just who she was. And she was full of joy and life. I had the opportunity to speak to Pastor Paul on a Sunday or uh, this last week. And just heard stories about his growing up. And those parents were involved in his spiritual life. He's like, he'll never forget at Grace Baptist when he was younger watching Ted Palpat, a man's man, walk up to the front of stage. You know, big, hairy, and just men are stoic and we don't. Show emotion or anything like that. Nope, that wasn't Ted. Ted got up in the front and unashamedly he was just worshiping God. And he's like, man, this is what it looks like to be a man of God. So the church has an amazing influence in the lives of youth and it changes them. How many of you remember when you were younger, middle or high school or even young adults, seeing people in your church like that, that really represented and reflected who, yeah, who Christ was and what it was like to be a follower of Christ. And I honestly think that Man, that is one of the most important things that we can do as a church family is to model our faith in front of these kids. Just a reminder in 1 John 3, 18, it made me think of it as I was preparing this sermon. It says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. And so then how do we be a positive influence in teenagers' lives? Well, before I tell you that, I really want all of our youth to stand up right now. Those that are in youth ministry, if you're in your first, sorry, but I want them to stand up because this is our youth. These are the teenagers in our youth ministry. A portion of them, some came to first service. 
But I want you to look around, and I want you to look at all the individuals in this room, because this is your family. These are the people that care about you, that love you. Look around. I know it's awkward. It's like, oh, man, I don't want to stare somebody in the face. All right. Look around. They love you. They care about you. They support you. I know that because they're always asking me, Matt, how can I pray for the youth? How can I support the youth? Once, stay standing up. One Sunday morning, we asked, man, we have kids going to Mexico building houses. Is there any way we can support them financially? Within two weeks, we raised $3,000 for them to build a house. That's because they love you. We have a new youth building back here. Not one hesitation from this church family to build it for you because they love you and they care about you and they support you and they continually ask these things. And so these people in this room, this is your family and I want you to know that. But I also want you to know that they need you. They need you to pray for them, to encourage them, to support them. They need you to go help them out. Some of them have needs that they can't maybe lift things or carry things or do tasks. You have time. So I just want you guys to see that this is the people who love you and want to support you. And also to let you know that as you plug into this church family and this community, because I know it's hard to talk to them sometimes, when you do that, that means you're more likely to do better in school, have better mental health, all these other factors that the CDC and the government says, yep, this is true. And so we want you to be a part of this family. We want you to know that you're loved. You guys may have a seat, all right? Whew, you can breathe. But for the rest of us as a church family, really, what does it look like to have a positive influence in these kids' lives? Is that we love them. And how do we love them? Well, the first thing is this, that we get to know their names. Hi, my name is so-and-so. What's your name? John. All right. Oh, it's good to see you. Thank you. All right. And that's it. And just get to know them. Encourage them. Let them know that you care. And I do have to recognize it's not easy. Because usually that conversation, the first two or three times you're talking with John is, is, how old are you, John? 10 or 14. Good. What do you like doing, John? I don't know. It's like, oh, man, this is like pulling teeth. Like, how do we... I can't can't go any longer, all right? Let's just get me out of this. But it's that time that they're trying to figure out, can I trust this guy? Can I, do they care about me? Or are they just really ready to tell me what I've done wrong or give me a lesson over how to do something better, right? And so just encourage you, get to know their names, love on them. And the same thing is, is that we live it out. You know, parents, that's for you as well, but for us as a church family, how do they see what it looks like to be a follower of Christ? How do they see us worshiping? How do they see us serving? How do they see us getting to know them? Is church, when I graduate high school, is church going to be a place that welcomes me and loves me? Or is it going to be a bunch of scary adults that are like, just sit down and shut up and then everything will be good? You know, it's like, am I welcome when I graduate? Do I belong here? What does a church family look like? Do they love and care for all ages, regardless of how shocking they might be? And once, they, once you break through those barriers, man, it's a beautiful thing. I remember, I mean, so often when a new youth comes into my room, it is, it is that hard to have a conversation with a teenager. But once they start coming after a few weeks, oh, it's a joy to watch them grow and to open up and to thrive. And that's what I'm asking for us as a church family. That we'd show love towards one another, that we would really live out our faith because they are watching. Many of you do this already. And so I'm thankful for that because it's not about just what we do in the youth ministry, it's what we do as a church family. And I recognize over this, this last weekend, we had a cornhole tournament where Al Lerma and Brian Ernest put on this tournament and they said, hey, we want, we want the youth to be there. And so they let the youth come for free and about seven or eight guys came and these men throwing bean bags across a room, why, why we do these silly games, I don't know, but we love it. They just loved on these students. They welcomed them, they encouraged them, great throw, good job. Well done, Alex, that was awesome. And that's what these kids need, is that we just, I mean, it's not hard to come to a tournament, bring your kid and, or have them come, and they just get to, it doesn't take any time out of that, just to love and encourage them. And so, Alex, you had fun, didn't you? I know, I pointed him out first, says yes. Yeah, Alex had a good time at the Cornell tournament, he was thankful Bob Bush, Jesse Good, Nolan Sturgeon. And they, they have boats, and they say, okay, I'll drive a boat for a weekend on the river. And these kids are watching these adults and say, hey, man, this guy cares about me. This guy's willing to spend the time and energy just to be there 
And I know the guys love it. The, the, the boat, boat driver's like, I get to drive a boat for a whole weekend? Okay, I'll do that. It's not that hard. And so these students recognize, and then that's, those are open opportunities for Bob to share his testimony or Nolan to share about and just some things that are going on in his life. We've got Pollyanna Maloche and Lori Snyder, who are grandmas and probably great-grandmas. And they help out on my middle school program. And they love on these kids. They just, hey, it's good to see you. And because they run my snack bar, kids kind of have to talk to them when they get up there. But this is what's great is they come up and they're welcomed with a smile. They know their name. And then once they get to know them just on their own account, they just buy them a little gifts or trinket saying, we're thinking about you. We're praying for you. And that makes all the difference. My youth staff, mostly right here, but around the room, I'm thankful for you and the time that you spend in their lives on a weekly basis. But guess what? After 40 students, I did not list 40 people. Wouldn't it be awesome for this church family for one kid to receive four people just to say, hi, what's your name? I'm so glad you're here. Four people to encourage them every week. I don't think it's that much, but those are the things that make all the difference in their lives. And that's what I'm asking you is four adults that know them by name and that encourage them on a weekly basis. It will take maybe a minute out of your Sunday morning. All right. I'm just encouraging you to do that because that is what's going to influence them in a positive way. That is what's going to help make their faith stick. And as we live that out and we love one another and we show that love in a church family, they're going to watch that and say, this is what church is supposed to be about. This is what it looks like to love one another. And so our future pastors are going to be doing that. And our future youth leaders and our future fathers and mothers are going to invest and care for those that are younger. And it's just going to continue. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And the last thing I want to encourage you with, um, goes in line with that, is this summer we're doing vacation Bible school on the evening service. And I'm excited for it. But I also think it's important to teach our youth how to serve. And so they've taken on, for those six weeks, helping the children's ministry. But there's also more needs that Billy is looking to fill in VBS. It's like, what a great opportunity to help out in VBS and serve the children's ministry. And then these teenagers get to see how adults serve and love on kids. And so I would love for you to go outside and sign up to serve alongside these youth and to show them what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And so Billy's out there. She's got those nice palm trees that... uh, you can see, and she'd just love to have you come up. I know the youth would love it. I'm thankful for you as a church family for what you're already doing and just ask that we continue to do it even more and more because that is what's going to make a positive influence in their lives and impact the next generation. So let me pray for us and invite the worship band up, and then we'll, uh, we'll close out our service. God, we do thank you so much that you're a God that loves us and that a mark of a follower of you, of a disciple, is that we love one another So this morning, it's no surprise that we recognize students' faith sticks because they're loved. And so I pray that us as a church family would seek to be more and more loving every day to our teenagers. And for some of the struggles that they're going through, that we would just be there to come alongside them. I thank you, Lord, for the church family that we have and the leaders and the support that we have already. And so, God, we just pray that with your help and the power of your spirit that we would be more loving and we would reflect you as we live our lives. So God, we thank you for this day and we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.